Dr. Wilbur, my first question is, uh, why did you decide to become an orthopedic surgeon in the first place? It's an interesting question. I mean, it's, um, I came from a medical family. I had a grandfather, a doctor, my father's doctor, uncle. And so, I mean, I guess I always thought I was going to some field of medicine, but in reality, I never really thought about surgery or orth orthopedic surgery. And uh, it wasn't until I started doing some rotations and I realized and I thought maybe I was going to do internal medicine. First rotation was internal medicine. And I really just like, I didn't like the service, you know, didn't enjoy uh, the type of problems they're dealing with. I didn't enjoy the attendings I was working with. And I just happened to rotate through orthopedics, uh, purely a two week rotation, elective rotation. Uh, and I fell in love with it. It was actually no question in my mind. That's what I wanted to do. Um, and actually, that's where I met my first mentor, uh, Dr. Charles Herndon, who was the chairman of orthopedics. And he was such an impressive personality and, and man uh, that it really sort of compelled me to sort of follow in his footsteps and, and go into orthopedic surgery. That's, uh, that's quite a chance encounter, as it turns yeah. out. <laughs> um, well, then, you know, the question I'm really excited to, to hear the answer to is, um, you know, in the, in the mid 80s, you know, what led to your decision to study orthopedic trauma and Specifically, what took you to Switzerland to work with Professor Rudy? I mean, as residents, even as medical students, we all love the trauma side of orthopedics. Uh, it's exciting. You know, you can get involved with it, everybody at different levels. And so everybody loves it. But at that point, no one was going into it because there really wasn't a field. I mean, no one really thought about so taking that as a real career. It was something you just sort of did. Um, and originally, as I went through, though I loved it and everything, I didn't have a mentor or someone that would sort of would lead me in that direction. Uh, and so I was going into shoulder surgery. I was actually accepted for the Charles Neer Fellowship in New York City uh, in shoulder surgery. Wow. I'd accepted it, I'd gone and interviewed, accepted it, and I was excited to go into it. And uh, then um, in my uh, end of my junior year, going into my senior year, uh, Ted Hansen came to town and gave a visiting professorship. Um, and I remember Steve Benerska and I sitting in the back of the room, totally impressed by Ted Hansen. Ted was talking about putting hardware in open wounds and riding femurs and stuff like that. And it was all the things that we enjoyed to do. And yet we had someone here who had made a career of it. And so with that, um, I started thinking about going into trauma, realized there was very few trauma uh, positions in the country. And, um, but I still wanted to do it. So I actually, I backed out of my shoulder fellowship, uh, called Ted Hansen up saying that uh, I wanted to do trauma and could he give me a job? Uh, he couldn't do that at the time uh, because there was no more positions open at that point. He only had two, uh, three positions and they were all full at the time. Mm -hmm. And so I basically started looking around. And I guess I was very fortunate that later on that year, uh, Ted lost most of his faculty. And though he couldn't hire me as a fellow, uh, he hired me as faculty. And so I actually got to go there as sort of a fellow, uh, but in reality, my position was as a faculty member. And the other fellows were elevated too. So basically we were the faculty at Harborview doing our fellowship. Wow, that's incredible. And then uh, at, after that year, um, you know, tell me about what led you to Switzerland and, and your experience out there. And what, what do you remember from that year? What was the most memorable uh, part of your year? Yeah. Once again, it was all Ted again. I mean, Ted told me if I wanted to do trauma, uh, that if I wanted to learn the AO technique, I had to go to Switzerland. Uh, and he was a good friend of Tom Rudy. And so he recommended I go, I go spend some time with Tom Rudy. And actually during my fellowship year, this is the year that uh, uh, Ted, uh, Tom Rudy, Martin Algauer, and uh, John Border were writing their book. Uh, and so I actually met all four of those people and got to know them fairly well because they'd come to, to Seattle and work on the book and stuff like that. So I actually got to meet them during that time. And so then, you know, in the spring of that year, after I finished my fellowship at Harborview, I went off to a course Switzerland to spend time with uh, Tom Rudy. Uh, Tom was there, and uh, Martin Algauer was retired from practice. Uh, Martin spent a lot of time at, at Core because he was good friends with Tom. He was Tom's a mentor. And so I got to know them very, very well during that time. Wow. Yeah, it must have been an amazing experience. Um, I guess uh, kind of moving past your training, um, since it was completed, um, you know, who did you learn the most from in your early career? You know, take me through, uh, you know, the first few years of your of your clinical practice and who shaped it the most for you or helped you? Yeah, when I was looking at a practice, I had, my choice was we're staying at Harborview uh, or coming back to uh, Cleveland at uh, Case Westinger, which was my home. It was a tough choice because uh, uh, my two best friends, Steve Benershka and Keith Mayer, both stayed on at Harborview. So I was really tempted to stay, but Cleveland was home. So I thought I'd come back and try to make my own place here. But there was really no one else, in, no one in Cleveland at the time really doing trauma. 
And so I relied heavily on the people back at Harborview. I was calling uh, Ted and Steve and Keith uh, probably on a weekly basis uh, for ideas and, and, and problem solving and just talking about life in general, doing trauma and stuff like that. So, I mean, I really relied on them extremely heavily for probably the first five years all the time. And then as time goes on, you know, a little bit less, but they've always been very close mentors and friends. That's great. Tell me what you enjoy the most about your academic practice and um, not what you like and, and also what frustrates you about practicing academic trauma. Well, the best part are the residents and fellows. You know, we've had a fellowship here now getting back to uh, 1989. We've had, um, I guess now going on 28 fellows and even more for we've had 35 residents go into trauma. So we've had, you know, over 60 people from our program go into trauma. And they really sort of stimulate you on it, it, That's what they make it exciting. You couldn't do trauma without, you know, like residents and good fellows and good partners. And so you need those. And that's what, that's the most fun of it, you know? And then obviously the stimulus of doing exciting cases, the big cases, everything's a little bit different. And then seeing the people come back and these are people whose lives have been basically destroyed and you put them back together again. What you think um, some of the most important advances in orthopedic trauma care have been um, during the course of your career? Well, I think, I think technology was a huge part of it, but certainly not all of it because technology can be uh, used and can also be abused. Uh, and so I've seen a lot of technology come through that really wasn't used correctly or, or was unnecessary and just increased the cost of things. Uh, but certainly the, the evolution of the implants, uh, especially with the company like Synthes, and, which are produced through the AO, have made a huge difference because they've, they've been extremely well thought out, they've been tested, and they were taught that we were taught to use it correctly. So I think the technology was very important. Um, I think even more importantly though, are organizations like the AO, uh, which brought pe people like minded people together. Uh, and you could share ideas, uh, you could help people with developing new things. And I think it really promoted the, the field of trauma into a real specialty, into a real group of highly trained, highly professional uh, people who I think have made a huge difference in, in taking care of people who are badly injured. And I would love to hear your thoughts on what some of those challenges were earlier in your career and how those have changed as your career has gone forward. Um, what, things, what things have changed for you and um, you know, what would you tell to the aspiring orthopedic trauma surgeon that they might expect early versus later in their career? Yeah. Well, it's changed a lot. I mean, early on, I think our biggest challenges were basically lack of resources and I think maybe lack of respect for what you do. Um, we weren't supported well at all. We weren't paid well. Um, we didn't have trauma rooms. Uh, we had a fight for all the time we had. We'd usually be up all night long doing cases because you couldn't, you had a choice of doing them that night or the next night. And so you knew it was best for the patient to do it that night. So you did them right away. And so I think the, the lack of resources and respect were probably the biggest problems. And I think that's changed. I think the, the evolution of the respect, I think the uh, trauma surgeons are well respected right now. I think that uh, we've done a great job doing that. I think that at, at the advent of the trauma room, I think has been very important. Uh, I think maybe it's a little bit overused. I think that we probably should do a few more cases during the, the course of the night, but I think the trauma room has been a huge ad advent for a better care of patients. I think the challenges are more basically, where do we go next? I think that a, there's been a lot of major advances with technology and the treatment and everything like that. Uh, but what really, what are the next challenges for the next generation? And uh, yeah, I'm not sure what they really are right now. I think there are gonna be challenges. I think that it's, it's gonna be have to do uh, many times maybe with biologics, their role in biologics. I think more importantly, it has to do with the cost of care. I think that the cost of care has gone up tremendously. Uh, you can't keep accepting more and more expensive devices when you only add a little bit of improvement, if any at all. And I think we have to be better stewards of how we, how we do our medical care and make sure that we really are not only giving quality, but giving value and, 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 and preserving the resources and doing them appropriately. Tell me uh, one of your most memorable patient care experiences, whether positive or negative or both. And uh, you know, how did it shape your career? What did you, what did you take away from that experience? You know, we're, we're looking back at over 35 years of, of patients, so it's, it's hard to pick out any one. Um, I mean, I think that early on, I had a patient that came in very badly injured, uh, very drunk motorcycle uh, rider, and basically everything was broken. He was in really bad shape. Uh, and uh, he came in, and this was very early on in my career, 
and uh, he had so many injuries, you would, didn't know quite what to do with him. Uh, and I remember he was as drunk as can be because he was vomiting over the room and everything. And um, we took care of what we could, you know, basically. And our problem then was many times the trauma surgeons wouldn't let you keep going. They'd say, well, he's too sick, you can't touch him. Uh, and so we, we would do what we could. We'd take him back when he was more stable. And though so we got many of the fractures fixed and fixed fairly well, many of them we never got to, uh, which, and he, he survived. He actually did fairly well, but he had a terrible right knee and right ankle. Uh, and, uh, you know, he, he suffered that the rest of his life. And I realized from that that I mean, you have to really push to be the advocate for your patients. Um, and I think that we pushed harder. I think he might have done better. He survived and did well. Um, but I think you have to be the advocate for your patients. Yeah, absolutely. I still see him. Do you? 35 years later, he still comes back and sees me. That's so cool. Um, so one thing that I'm kind of interested in is um, this is sort of the age of uh, information saturation. Um, you know, it's, it can be overwhelming to long, young learners um, kind of where to find the best information and, and how to uh, uh, kind of fill the holes in their trauma knowledge. And so in an age like this, what advice do you have for students and residents uh, who aspire to be orthopedic trauma surgeons or who just want to be able to provide excellent fracture care as part of their practice? Well, I think the biggest thing is don't inspire inspire to do 100 publications. I think all you do is flood the literature. Um, you, you want to be, think about what needs to be proven still. What do we need to know? And, 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 and work on that, but don't work on the volume of just paper after paper. It just, we don't know what to do with all this information. And so many of the papers now were, so either proving the obvious or reproving things that we forgot about before. And you can't keep doing that. Uh, I think you really have to be, look carefully at what we need to know. How can we improve medicine and, and work on that? I mean, how you supple through all the information is beyond me. I, I don't know. I mean, I get my journals in. I, I read through the, the index every time. And I probably pick out maybe one or two articles that I'll actually read during that time that I think will have an impact on the way I, I treat people. And I think you have to do that. You have to keep looking. Sometimes hidden in, in, in articles, you'll find something which is important. You know, And so I think it's important to keep reading, keep up on the literature. Uh, but be selective in what you read. I think you can't read everything. Um, and so you have to be selective and, and basically, and, and look for areas of, of lack of knowledge in yourself uh, where you need to sort of concentrate on things. And so if something new comes up and you come across an idea in a paper, research that idea and see what's out there. You know, go back and dig farther back in the literature instead of just keep reading more and more stuff, go back in a certain topic, hone in on that and see what the literature really tells you in the past. Uh, and I think you'll learn more that way by being digging deeper into a topic than reading everything. Mm -hmm. I think that's really good advice. Um, this is sort of a strange question to ask someone, you know, with your experience in history, but um, when you look back over your career, is there anything that you would do differently or is there anything that you look back and, um, you know, something that you really, uh, an experience you really learned from that um, you sometimes wonder if you had done something different in the past? I would certainly take advantage of even more op opportunities. Um, I'd encourage people to really look and broaden their horizons beyond just the ordinary things. The things that made a difference in my career were, were going to Seattle and going to Switzerland. Um, two things which were not common to do at that time. And so I would say, look for unique opportunities uh, and look for unique individuals with unique ideas and follow up on it. Because I think that's, that's where the new technology is going to be, the new ideas are going to be, not the same old thing over and over again. Um, you know. Look for different places to visit, different people to visit who have maybe different ideas than what you think are mainstream, but that may be the future. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, you've interviewed a lot of uh, uh, fellow candidates. Uh, you know, you interviewed me nine years ago, 10 years ago. Um, when you are looking for fellowship candidates, what qualities are you looking for, um, you know, in a, in a resident, uh, you know, for someone who might be aspiring to, to do a trauma fellowship? What is it that you as a director are looking for? I'm, I'm looking more for motivation. Why are they doing this? Because uh, that's what gets you through the tough nights, not you know the stimulation of an exciting case, something like that, or, or the technology. It really is, you're, why are you doing it? Are you looking to help people to make a difference? Or are you looking just to you know, make some money? Uh, you may be the greatest technician in the world, uh, but unless you have the right motivation, you won't use that appropriately. 
Uh, same way with the knowledge, you may be the smartest person in the world, but if you don't have the right motivation, that knowledge can be used you know, in the wrong ways. And so motivation by far is the most important thing. Great. I suppose my, my final question for you is, um, how do you find uh, work-life balance and what, what uh, advice do you have for the, the young trauma surgeon who's trying to find that balance in their own life? Balance is critical. Um, it's easier to do now than it was before because you have more people doing trauma. Uh, you have the trauma room. Uh, and so you want to take advantage of that. You know, I think that you have to decide what's important for you, lay out the things, and, and you have to take time off and you have to do it yourself. No one's going to sit there and say, you need to go home today, or you need to spend more time with your family, or you need to take a vacation, um, uh, or you need to write more papers. You know, These are all things you have to decide what you got to do in your own life. And so you have to take an active role uh, as to how you're going to use your time. Because one thing you learn more than anything else is time is the most important thing. Uh, you can't get it back. So you really want to preserve your time and use it appropriately and balance it out in, in all aspects of your life. You know, thank you so much for your time. This has actually been really interesting. Uh, you've had quite the career and, uh, you know, it was really great working with you back when I was in Cleveland. And uh, I'm really appreciative of this opportunity to talk to you and share, share this stuff with everybody. So thank you. Good. Well, thank you very much. It was a pleasure working with you back then and still con uh, contributing with you now. So thank you very much. Yeah.